Martin, thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction. And thank you very much to uh, the Oxford Centre for inviting me to give this seminar as part of the fascinating series that you've organised for coming weeks and months. Um, I see we have quite an attendance and I'm delighted with that. So thank you to all for, for taking the time to come to this seminar. I yeah, saya juga lihat ada banyak teman dari uh, Malaysia dan mungkin ada juga dari Indonesia. Jadi selamat datang kepada ceramah ini. And um, kalau nanti mau mengajukan pertanyaan dalam bahasa Malaysia, bahasa Indonesia, boleh atau bahasa Inggris. So apart from that, I've just exhausted my Indonesian vocabulary. Um, I will go on with my lecture. Um, and I will just share the screen of my PowerPoint. Good, so um, this this lecture is, I've called it um, Christian Muslim Relations in Colonial Southeast Asia from 1600 to 1800, a work in progress. And um, I, I, I'm actually breaking up this research project into several sections, indeed chapters, and this will be a chapter. Um, so I could have looked at the modern period, uh, Christian Muslim relations in the modern day in Southeast Asia. And indeed, I did that at a conference um, for the European Association of Southeast Asian Studies in September. So that's that's there as well. Um, so I, I need to go back and look at the history. So this is essentially a historical um, study. I'd just like to acknowledge the work of the Christian Muslim Relations uh, Bibli Bibliographical History Project. Um, which was initiated and funded by the British government, um, managed by the University of Birmingham and is being published um, by Brill Publishers out of Leiden in a multi-volume series, up to 22 or thereabouts volumes. Excellent work that contains a wealth of information on the history of Christian Muslim interaction in Southeast Asia and right across the world. So Southeast Asia is just one small part uh, one window into this massive project. So I've been part of the team there. And uh, as you can see uh, from that cover page, the um, lead editors, uh, the project director, David Thomas and Dr. John Chesworth, who's from the Oxford Centre. And I think John's with us today. It's been a great project and I'll, I'll be drawing extensively on material from that um, project today, um, but supplementing it with other materials as well. Um, I'm going to break my talk really into two sections. I'm going to first think about big history, um, and then I'm going to think about, in a sense, people's history. Big history is the kind of history that I guess we all learnt in schools, the history of famous people, political leaders, um, generals uh, who led armies into battle, and the big events. Um, that's, that's really big history. And of course, big history provides the backdrop, provides a framework for what happens uh, on the ground among the societies. And so let's begin with some big history. And, and here, I'm just skimming across the surface. I know that some of you, well, especially from Southeast Asia, know Southeast Asia very well, but there will be other members of the audience who don't know Southeast Asia well. So I'm just giving you a broad outline of the big history of Southeast Asia in the period under examination, namely, um, from 1600 to 1800. Here's a diagram that's helpful. Um, like any diagram of this sort, obviously it's approximate, but it shows you the um, process, the sort of trajectory of the entry and the spread of, of the Islamic faith into the region of Southeast Asia. So initially in the 13th and 14th centuries, although there were Muslims who came before that as well, that date really talks about when communities were really established, city-states. Then the 15th century, <laughs> further expansion, 16th century to the 17th and 18th centuries. And this is what we're looking at today, this, this period here. Um, and of course, as Islam expanded, um, there, were, there was the evolution of, of particular major city-states, sultanates, and really one of the very first and most important, in a sense, was the Sultanate of Malacca, which was at its greatest extent, at its greatest peak in the 1400s, in the 15th century. Um, Malacca was then conquered by the Portuguese in 1511, and later it 
was conquered by the Dutch and later it was taken over by the British. So Malacca has a very rich and um, entwined history um, from various periods, as does so much of Southeast Asia. Other great sultanates came and went. The Sultanate of Aceh um, uh, was, was at its greatest extent in the <coughs> early part of the 17th century, the 1600s, under the rule of Sultan Iskandar Muda. So that's a second great sultanate. So we have a sense in this formative period of the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, leading to our period of the existence of great Islamic uh, empires, great Islamic sultanates. Down in Java as well, there was a great center, uh, an Islamic community sultanate in Damak, um, the great sultanate of Mataram in, in central Java, which extended its power far and wide was also very strong. And these, these Islamic sultanates were at their peak just before the arrival of the European colonial powers. Sultanate of Sulu in the south of the Philippines, it controlled, you know, that's covering its area. It's controlled the northern part of Borneo, the island of Palawan, uh, the southern part of <laughs> Mindanao. And of course, in Mindanao, you had another great sultanate of uh, Maguindanao as well. But then the European colonial powers arrived. Again, this is before our period in focus. So the Spanish arrived during the 1500s. Uh, they established themselves. The Portuguese arrived during the 1500s. So they were the two major colonial presences in the 1500s, which came in and which effectively curtailed the expansion, much of the expansion of, of Islam, of the Islamic sultanates. And the Dutch, of course, came as well. And, and you, you, you're no doubt well aware that the Dutch colonized the present day Indonesia. And there you have stages of that colonization period as well. So the red period, period was before 1800. So these areas were colonized by the Dutch over in Malacca as well. Then uh, the light, lighter color there was between 1801 and 1870. So it expanded right through Java. And then, of course, um, after 1871, it expanded to the very limits of present day Indonesia. So that is a very broad brush approach to big history. That's the framework, the context that sets up our period. So when we move to our period in focus, and our period in focus begins at, 18, at 1600, 17th and 18th centuries, 1600 to 1800. We have a situation where there have been great Islamic empires. The Spanish and the Portuguese have arrived for during the previous century. There is tension, there is rivalry, there is conflict. And as we begin our period of 1600, the Dutch and the British are about to arrive themselves. Before we turn to the voices, of Christians and Muslims in, in those 200 years. Let's just think a little bit about the, about the text. What's the situation in this stage of the, of, the, of the text, of the sacred text of both faiths of Christianity and Islam? Well, in our period, 1600 to 1800, both the, the Quran and the Bible were available. The earliest surviving evidence for both <coughs> dates from the early 17th century from the early 1600s. Now, clearly, um, the, the Bible and the Quran were there beforehand, especially the Quran, but there are no surviving examples from before our period. Uh, the earliest surviving example of the Quran into Malay, um, um, uh, from the Malay world was brought back dates from the early 1600s and uh, the Bible was translated into Malay in the 1620s and from the 1620s onwards. So this is an image of the oldest excerpts, oldest sample of the Quran uh, originating from Southeast Asia that still survives. It's um, taken from those who can read uh, Arabic or Jawi will read that, Suratul uh, Mujadila, Surah 58. Um, and it's the, it's the entire surah that's contained within that manuscript that's held in the collection of the University of Cambridge Library. And elsewhere in that manuscript, 
there is a signature by a copyist dated to 1604. Um, so that's why we know that this, this, this fragment dates from around 1600. So that's the oldest surviving example uh, of the Quran from Southeast Asia. And of course, there were Qurans earlier, but because of the climate, uh, those earlier Qurans didn't survive. And this one survived because it was back in Europe in a cooler climate. Another very interesting old Quran from Southeast Asia um, was a result of a partnership between the Dutch and the Sultanate of Johor. After the Portuguese captured Malacca in 1511, the local Sultanates wanted to recapture Malacca from the Portuguese. And when the Dutch arrived, the Sultanate of Johor and the Dutch formed a, formed a cooperation to, to, to try and recapture um, Malacca together. And in 1606, Malacca, Portuguese Malacca was put under siege by a combined fleet of the Dutch under this admiral and the Portuguese, uh, I'm sorry, and the, and the Johor uh, Sultanate. So the Dutch and the Johor Sultanate combined to besiege uh, Malacca unsuccessfully. So the siege was not successful, but the Sultan of Johor, to say thank you to the Dutch admiral, he gave him this beautiful Quran. It's a complete Quran, um, hand copied, as you can see. And the Dutch admiral brought it back to Holland, and it now is held in the collection of the Rotterdam Municipal Library, dating, well, it was given to the admiral in 1606, so about 1600 or so. So again, that's the oldest complete Quran we have from Southeast Asia. As for the Bible, well, from 1628, um, Christians in Southeast Asia, col uh, colonial officials were beginning to translate the Bible into Malay. And by 15, uh, 1651, there was a copy of the Gospels and Acts in Malay. Um, and from then on, later, later on in that century, the entire New Testament was translated. So that's the earliest available biblical materials available in Malay uh, in Southeast Asia. So we know the texts are there. We've got a picture of the big history. Where to from here? Well, let's move from big history to people's history. And by people's history, I'm talking about the voices of people. You know, when we talk about battles and sultanates, they're sort of big events and big things. But what about people? How do people interact? And it's, it's at the level of the people that Christian-Muslim interaction is at its most interesting, of course. And sometimes it's most challenging as well. Here I'm going to draw on um, I'm going to draw on a, a, a typology that was developed by my friend and colleague Professor Douglas Pratt. In this book, which was just published last year, it's part of the Christian Muslim Relations series. Professor Pratt included a chapter, and in the chapter he collected a a, a mass of documents where Christians and Muslims were talking about each other. And he asked the question, how are they talking about each other? How would you categorize the types of conversations or the types of interactions people are having? And as I say, he worked from a very large database and he concluded that there were, from the, his materials, there are four basic types of interactions that he noticed. First, there are interactions of antipathy, polemical interactions, suspicion, dislike, caution. So that was the first type of <coughs> interaction that he noticed in his materials. Secondly, he said there's also apologetic material. He calls it appeal. So um, the types of interactions where the Christians or Muslims are writing materials to defend their faith against the other. So it's not as hostile as antipathy, but it's more designed to defend the Christian faith or the Muslim faith against the other. <clears throat> Thirdly, he said, the third type of interaction is an interaction that is more open-minded, more willing to accommodate the other or being curious and wanting to inquire about the other. So it's not hostile, it's not defensive, it's more inquiring and accommodative. And finally, he said, from his materials, he said, you then get a set of materials where you see affinity 
or commonality where the focus is, in, is on what is shared. Commonality, shared experience, shared views. So not hostile, not defensive, not curious, but actually affinity-based and shared. Now, this is a very good, very good uh, framework, I find, for looking at my materials. Um, and what's interesting, and here, I, in a sense, I'm going to give away part of my conclusion. What's interesting is that I look at, as I look at the different centuries, I find that the, that the balance of these types of engagement shifts. Now, in our centuries today that we're looking at, the, 16th, the 17th century and the 18th century, or the 1600s and the 1700s, what we find is a heavier weighting up here. Then I find when I'm looking at the later periods, I'm finding that there's more of a weighting down here. So that's just a kind of heads up. In a sense, it's a, well, it's a heads up to let you know where I'm going, but it's also a heads up to let you know that unfortunately today, more of our material is of a more polemical kind because we're talking about the 1600s and the 1700s. So let's proceed. Let's, let's begin by looking at the different categories. Let's look at some examples of Christian and Muslim writing about each other, starting with that first category that Professor Pratt has identified, antipathy. And here I'm just giving, I'm just drawing some examples to give you. So let's go first out to the little island of Rosengain out here, out in the, in the area of the Malakas in Eastern Indonesia. And we're dealing very early, this is very early in the period of interaction of 1622. And uh, these materials um, tell the story of a group of missionaries who went out to this island to preach Christianity, to um, share Christianity with the Muslims out there looking for converts to, to, to Christianity. And the locals, in their interactions, they asked the missionaries what they thought of Muhammad, what their opinion was of Muhammad. And this was the answer of the missionaries. Now, I'm not going to read it because it's not very nice, but it gives you an idea of kind of polemical writing in that early stage. And one of the things that strikes me as I look at the materials moving down the centuries is that in the earliest period when Christians and Muslims were first meeting each other, their ideas were shaped by stereotypical views rather than by interactions with real people. That's one example. I'll, we'll look at some other examples. Um, the Documenta Malukensia is another set of materials. These are records of um, Jesuit operations, Jesuit documents, again, from the area of the Malakas in Eastern, Eastern Indonesia. And again, we're talking of the, well, that goes back into the 1500s. So this is early, um, you know, 1600s and 1700s, mostly in the period of under examination. And again, we find that these early interactions, the, the stereotypes are what comes through, namely that Muslims are very sensual, materialistic idea of heaven, religion was propagated by the sword, can't be trusted and, <coughs> and so forth. So these are the kinds of polemical perspectives presented in these early period. Let's move up to Southern Philippines, the island of Mindanao here. Uh, this is another Jesuit, Diego de Bobadilla. Um, he lived squarely in the period under examination. Um, he was involved in Jesuit educational institutions. And on his second visit to the Philippines, he served as the administrator. Um, and um, sorry, just checking that my, my, my microphone is still working. Yes, all good, good. Um, so Bob Adela served as, a, as a, uh, the administrator of missionaries down here. And, and again, he wrote something called the account of glorious victories. Um, and he leaves no doubt that the Spanish fighting down here against the Muslim population, Spanish <coughs> fighting to take territory from the Muslims was not only supported and directed by God, but also blessed by him as well. In other words, they, he saw it as a kind of holy war, kind of Christian, Christian jihad. <coughs> 
few more to look at here. Um, going back to the Netherlands East Indies, Jan Petersen Koen was a was a very famous early Dutch. Um, he was the governor general, served two um, two, se two sessions as the governor general of the Netherlands East Indies. And he was a very tough-minded man. He was, he was a probably not a very nice person. Actually, he was he was quite tough. And he he tried to establish a um, a Dutch monopoly on trade in the Indies to exclude other European powers, but also telling the local sultanates who they could, could trade with. And um, the local locals didn't didn't appreciate that. Uh, and some of the um, some of the local communities in the Moluccas, for example, refused to um, refused to take part, refused to observe the monopoly that he was trying to establish. So he then uh, launched, he sent in military forces, there were there was violence, uh, there were there was enslavement. And later on, when he wrote his memoirs, he had some very bad things to say about Muslims. And of course, they come out of came out of that, uh, that period of, of violent conflict, which his policies had triggered. George Rumpf was a colonial administrator, not as high up as Kern. Um, he was highly critical of folk, folk practices. And, and, and his, he is an example of, of something which of a, of a, a concept, which I find quite, quite interesting. When I read what Rumpf had to say, he went out, um, visited the, the area of Bima in the eastern archipelago, eastern part of Indonesia, and he observed the local uh, Muslim community as they were practicing some folk practices, some mystical practices, bertapa, um, and he was highly critical of them. Um, and so he wrote quite a lengthy description of what he saw. And the pity is, if you take the polemical part out of what he writes, it's actually quite interesting. Um, if you take out the polemical bits and you're just left with the descriptive part, there is some very interesting material in there about cultural history. But of course, it was overlaid by this polemical opinionated writing. Um, I'll we'll just look at something from this man and then I think I'll skip ahead to um, to look at some, some Muslim writings of a similar vein. Francois Valentin was quite a well-known um, uh, Dutch Dutchman went to he went as a minister with the Dutch East Indies Company. Um, he was very interested in, in uh, nature, and he was a naturalist. And he, in a sense, Valentine represents the worst of polemical writing from the from the Christian side. Um, and I won't take the time to read it, but as I go over, you know, the, the this is being recorded, so you can stop and read it if you like. Some of the some of the very negative things he said uh, about Islam. So let me go forward now. I'm just going to move forward to Muslim writings of a similar style. That is this sort of anti antipathy kind of approach. Um, and um, a very interesting phenomenon happens here. That is that with both Christians and Muslims, when Christians and Muslims met in Southeast Asia, when the Portuguese arrived and the Spanish arrived, in a sense, they, even though many Southeast Asians had not actually met Christians before, and the Christians had not necessarily met Muslims. They already had opinions formed. In terms of the Spanish and the Portuguese, they remembered the fighting in Al-Andalus. They remembered the wars in Al-Andalus against the Moors. And so when they arrived in Southeast Asia and they saw Muslims, they thought Moors back in Al-Andalus, so they called them Moros. And in a sense, their opinion of Southeast Asian Muslims was already made up even before they arrived. And in a sense on the Muslim side, it was similar because the Muslim, um, the, the, the Malay, um, in the Malay world, one of the greatest forms of entertainment are some of the great stories called the Hikayat, the Hikayat literature. And much of the Hikayat literature with rich colorful stories originates from the Middle East. So stories like the Hikayat uh, Muhammad Hanafiya, or the Hikayat Amir Hanza, Hanza. These are stories that come from the Middle East with accounts of battles between Christians and Muslims back in the Arab world. And so those stories came out to Southeast Asia and, and the Malays read this. And so they already had a sense from their Hikayat that Christians represented types of adversaries. Um, you... Here's one example where Christians are compared with fire worshippers. 
from some of the Hikayat literature. Um, and Hikayat Iskandar Adulkarnain recounts of angels who pierced with lances the devils that dwelt in Coptic idols. So this idea of uh, Christianity being associated with um, fire worshipping or, or, or de demonic. Um, you, and there are, there are other examples of this. Um, I'll just flick over a couple more. The, this is some writing by uh, Nuruddin Araniri. He was a famous Muslim polemicist. And most of his polemical writing was directed actually against other Muslims. But in the process, he took a swipe at uh, Christians and Jews in the process. So in this one, one of his pieces, Sirat al-Mustaqim, uh, he instructed Muslims about cleaning after the toilet. And he said, if you, when you go to the toilet, use pages of the Bible uh, for, you, for cleaning yourself, but don't use any pages that have the word Allah on them. Um, Araniri was quite famous for that. And another example is by a famous writer who I've studied, I studied my PhD on, Abdurrauf Asinkili. And in one of his more minor works, he is usually not polemical against Christians. In fact, there's very little in his writing which is polemical against Christians. But in this one, in Lubal Kashf, he actually describes the process that people go through when they die. And he wrote, basing himself on an Arabic source, that when people die, they are tempted by demons who dress up as Jews and Christians, encouraging the dying person to become a Jew or a Christian. And finally, the other style of Muslim polemical writing is jihad literature. And in a sense, this is kind of understandable. At the end of the day, European colonial powers had arrived. Uh, they had been accompanied in, in, in cases with violence. They've established forts. And therefore, that aroused hostile expressions from local Muslims, which translated into jihad literature, such as uh, the Hikayat Tanahitu is one talking about the Hitu war from 641, 646 against the Dutch, where the local Imam called a jihad and led the fight against the Dutch. And you get this jihad rhetoric in the book. Another one is the Shair Parang Mankasar, uh, which refers to the war against the Dutch, um, between the Dutch and the Makassarese around the same time. <coughs> and again, it uses the language of jihad fighting the infidels. Um, from a later period, um, during the, uh, one of the great reformists among, uh, among Muslim literary history was uh, Abdul Samad al-Palimbani, who lived in the, uh, the 1700s, the 18th century. And he wrote letters to Javanese rulers, encouraging them to go on jihad against the Dutch colonizers. So jihad literature is another form of Muslim writing, which is polemical against, against Christians. And there is an example of some of Al Palimbani's writing, which if you want to look at it, you can stop the recording later and have a read of it. And here's an example from the Southern Philippines, um, Pangiran Bantilan. He was the younger brother of the Sultan of Sulu. And when his brother, the Sultan, allowed Jesuit missionaries into this area, this man, the younger brother, revolted, uh, overthrew his brother, took over the Sultanate, and then asked for, uh, sent a letter to the um, Ottoman Caliph requesting Ottoman assistance to fight the Spanish, <coughs> who then sent forces. And the letter again is very derogatory in the way it talks about Christians. Finally, and this is the last slide on the polemical stuff, and this is a variation on a theme. This is quite unusual because this is, this is sort of critical of Christians, but in, a, in terms of cultural practice, this is a very telling statement about uh, the writer is being critical of Christians, the Dutch, because of their hygiene or lack of hygiene in this case. And what do they say? Well, the writer has, has God speaking to Muhammad and says, oh, Muhammad, what distinguishes the Christians is that their arms branch out and they are constantly urinating. They use a constant fragrance to conceal their stink. The rotting stink might spread of the bodies of the devils and the Christians, so it's concealed with fragrance. Enemies of Jesus are these Christians, their forces, lions and gibbons and all the demons and devils. Okay.
so we've got through the we've got through the heavy stuff and and the period we're looking at 1600s 1700s had a lot of this material it does raise the question doesn't it the challenge for the historian the challenge for the historian is that we we have to work with what the evidence we have in front of us it's like a jigsaw puzzle you know you have so many pieces and you have to put the pieces together to create the picture and you therefore draw your conclusions from the picture you create <clears throat> but of course you don't have all the pieces as a historian do you we don't have all we don't have a record of all the countless human interactions between christians and muslims that happened between 1600 and 1800 and obviously when you think about it christians and muslims weren't fighting and arguing all the time in southeast asia over 200 years obviously there was a lot of interaction going on which would have been comfortable friendships would have been formed there would have been positive things nice things said to each other but they don't tend to be recorded it's a little bit like when we watch the evening news on television most of the evening news is about a crisis or about problems or about negative things Probably if they came on and they only gave us the news about the Queen opening a new building down there and the Prime Minister uh, having been given a new car and 10 Downing Street being painted, we'd probably turn the television off. And that's the problem. That's, you know, news on the television gives you the, 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 the inflammatory stuff. And that's the challenge for the historian. How do we paint the picture of history when we only hold a, set, a, a limited number of the pieces of the picture? Let's go on and look at some more pieces of the picture. Um, just checking the time. And we are now going to look very briefly at appeal and apologetics because I don't have much on this. And then we'll look at the, the, the more positive, the affinity, um, or uh, at least the, the, the inquiry materials. Appeal and apologetics, I'm just giving you one case study. And it's I'm not even sure it's appeal and apologetics. It's, you know, um, the line between apologetics and polemical writing is a very thin line and sometimes a piece of writing can really drift between the two and you think well is that apologetics or is that polemics is it apologetics defending something or is it attacking the other anyway the example i have is gispertus vortius again lived most of his life in the 17th century um, he um, was a was a quite a prolific writer actually. He didn't write a lot about Islam, but he wrote enough about Islam to give us an impression of his opinions. Um, he called Islam the most formidable non-Christian religion, and he wrote an eight pages long refutation of Islam in the introduction to that work. <coughs> now it was a refutation, but it was a, an apologetic refutation. So it was saying Islam says this, and the answer is basing doctrine putting doctrine against doctrine and he also wrote his own treatise on islam and carol steinbrick the, the late the late carol steinbrink a, a, a great scholar and a colleague on the christian muslim relations a bibliographical project who only passed away recently um, he, carol left quite a legacy in his own scholarship and he made this comment about Vautius's writing he said in spite of this generally negative impression of, uh, of muslims Vautius also mentioned a few positive aspects uh, such as the prohibition against images so is it apologetics well often polemics doesn't have anything good to say about the other whether it's christian polemics or muslim polemics it's just negative when you get into apologetics, sometimes you find it's a bit hard edged, but that some concessions are made as well. And that's that's worth looking at. And this is a work in progress. I'll be looking for more examples of that. So let's spend our remaining time looking at this um, third category. And as far as the affinity is concerned, which is Professor Pratt's fourth category, the affinity, the sort of commonality I don't have any examples to show you at this stage. I do from the later period, from the 19th century, um, I do have, have many more examples, but from the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, I don't have any. So here we're looking at inquiry and accommodation, which is nevertheless much more positive than polemics. Let's look at a few examples. Frederick de Holtman, very interesting man, a, a Dutchman, a sailor, 
Um, he was part of the one of the very earliest Dutch fleet fleets to go to um, to go to Indonesia, and had an interesting experience um, because when his fleet that was led by his brother Cornelius arrived in Aceh, initially there were negotiations between the Aceh Achenese and the Dutch, and then there was a fight, and Cornelius, his brother was who was the fleet commander, he was killed along with 28, I think, Dutchmen and some Achenese as well. Um, the remaining Dutch managed to get back to the ships and sail back to Holland, but Frederick was left behind uh, along with, I think, 20 other Dutchmen. And they were imprisoned and he spent two years in prison. Now you think, well, under such circumstances, he'd seen his brother killed, he was in, in a foreign prison uh, for two years, you'd think he'd be bitter. But actually, his writings are very interesting because you don't hear any sense of bitterness from his writing. What you hear is genuine interest in the Achenese life, their cultural patterns, their eth eth ethnicity and so forth, and also the, the religious doctrines of Islam. So he wrote this book, which was an introduction to the Malay language based on a set of conversations. Fascinating, actually. And, you know, he, he, he doesn't put anything that's negative in there. But he also wrote this short account of his time in prison. And he had many conversations with leading Islamic um, religious officials who tried to convert him to Islam. And he describes this, but he describes it in a way which is not at all polemical, which is just discussions of interest from his perspective. He was genuinely interested in the conversations. There was no polemic there. Interesting. Here's another interesting um, set of writings that are non-polemical, that are much more to do with this concept of inquiry and accommodation. The Dutch East Indies Company drew up a set of treaties over the 200 year period of their existence with local rulers, local Muslim rulers in uh, different parts of the archipelago. And these treaties called for harmony and friendship. Um, oaths were taken on the Bible and the Quran. Um, in, there are many passionate and optimistic statements about interreligious harmony. And there were many rulings in these treaties which actually prohibited, prohibited anybody changing their religion and mixing and mixed marriages. So what they were trying to do the two sides, the Dutch and the and the and the in Ambon, for example, was to reach an agreement to allow for trade interactions and community interactions, but not for it to erupt into conflict. Sometimes travelers' tales um, give us voices, a different kind of voice, the less polemical kind of voice. And these travelers' tales are, are quite important because what you find in the next century is that the travelers tend to go to the next stage of moving from interest in inquiry to actual admiration. Thomas Forrest was a British, an Englishman. He was a captain for the British East India Company. He, um, he went on a ship which traveled to um, uh, New Guinea and to the Malaccas and to the Southern Philippines, to Mindanao. And he wrote a description of what he saw and his description was um, non-polemical, it was just interesting. It was a, de a detached and objective description of what he, what he found. And here's an example, and I'll, I'll briefly, I'll read this. He described a wedding in the Malaccas saying, the woman attended by some of her own sex comes into the mosque and sits down. Then the Imam, or if the parties are persons of rank, the Caliph holding the man's right thumb asks him if he will marry that woman and live with her according to Muhammad's law. To this he answers, I will and so on. And this kind of description is what I mean. When, when earlier I talked about George Rumpf, who gave a similar description of what he saw, but he filled it with polemical under, undertones. This has no polemical undertones. It is a simple description of what he saw, which is very interesting for the cultural historian and the religious historian. Let's talk a little bit about um, Theologians, so far I've talked about um, softer positive comments from travelers and from colonial officials. Um, what about the theologians? Well, Francisco Combes was a theologian in, in Manila and he was actually 
criticized by some some um, Spanish missionaries who accused him of being more interested in his academic pursuits than he was in uh, in evangelism. He wrote a first-hand account of the main episodes of Christian-Muslim relations in the Philippine archipelago. He wrote, he wrote something that was a very important historical study of the Islamization of the Philippines. And in this work, he, dis he displays an admiration for the richness of Mindanao and Sulu, their cultures, and the necessity to, for the Spanish presence to stay to keep the warring parties apart, not Spanish-Muslim, but in Muslim against Muslim. So he, his argument was, we need to be here not to dominate, but to prevent local infighting. Well, that's, an, that's a different angle again. But nevertheless, he, he, his writing was much more positive. Jose Turubia, uh, he was a Franciscan ministry in the Philippine Islands. And there you have his years, 1721 to 1733. He wrote quite, a, quite an assortment of different materials. Um, and he explains in rational and systematic ways the tactics used in the expansion of Islam in the Philippines in that quite in, in that important study, one of the uh, most important studies really from that early period of Spanish uh, colonization about the history of the Philippines. What about on the Muslim side? Well, here's a curious one. This was a tale that was written in the middle of the 18th century, so maybe 1750. Uh, a mythological tale describing the entry of the Dutch to Java. And this was written, this is a Muslim uh, account. And in this account, um, the Dutch are described, as they arrive in Java, they are described as being descended from Iskandar Dhulkarnain. Now, Iskandar Dhulkarnain is one of the prophets mentioned in the Quran. And this work says the Dutch are descended from Iskandar Dhulkarnain. Now, why would they do that? Now, Pijot, a famous Dutch uh, scholar from the last century, from the 20th century, he says, well, <laughs> the reason for this is that the Javanese had been defeated in the war against the Dutch. And so they needed, this is his theory, they needed some explanation to explain why they were defeated. And so the explanation was that the Dutch had certain supernatural powers. And my final example is is an unusual one. This is an example of a sultan who converted to Christianity. Doesn't happen very often. In fact, I only know of one such case. Ali Muddin of Sulu, or the Arabic version of his name is Adi Muddin. He became sultan of Sulu in 1735. He, he allowed, he wrote to the Spanish king, allowing Jesuit missionaries to come into his domains. And as I mentioned earlier in this lecture, that triggered a revolt against him by his brother, uh, Pangiran Bantilan, who overthrew him. Anyway, this Sultan, he was thrown out of power. He was deposed. He went to Manila and he converted to Christianity and he was baptized in 1750. And then there was a civil war. And that was when his brother who had taken the throne wrote to the Ottomans to ask for assistance. That's an interesting one, but <coughs> in his own writing, this Sultan Ali Muddin um, has some positive things to say about Christianity. So just wrapping up, where does this leave us? Well, in the 1600s and 1700s, according to the evidence available, the the, the weighting of materials leans more towards polemical attitudes, attitudes of antipathy, to use Professor Pratt's phrase. So the evidence in front of me tells me that more of the writing is, uh, is polemical. Now, the, the footnote, which again I repeat, is that this is the challenge for the historian. How representative is that material? Um, what about all the positive interactions that must have happened that weren't written down? And as I say, this is a work in progress, so I'm still processing that one. Nevertheless, there were clearly, there was a body of material where we were definitely seeing uh, inquiry, accommodation, willingness to allow the other to looking for ways to work together. And interestingly, at this stage, that seems to be coming more, these are preliminary findings, that seem to be coming more from the writings of colonial officials 
than from the writings of religious people, whether Christian or Muslim. Now, why would that be? Well, um, Michael Laffin, is, who's a very um, accomplished scholar from Princeton University, he says uh, in one of his studies, he says, well, the colonial officials were just not interested in Islam, so you don't get the polemical writing from them. And that's an interesting thought. I would take it further. What we have to realize is that the period that we're examining, 1700, uh, 1600 to 1800, was the period of, of the erosion, in a sense, the, the movement towards liberal thinking, the enlightenment, um, the decline of Christianity in, in, in Europe. So many colonial officials, sure, they mightn't have been interested in Islam, but they mightn't have been very interested in Christianity either. And we have to then ask the question, well, how Christian were they? Um, so that's, that's an interesting one. Um, certainly when we move into the next century, and I'm working on that at the moment, we are seeing a continuation of polemical writing, but we're seeing more writing of affinity, uh, more writing by people who were genuinely interested in each other. And again, I think the lesson there, and this is my last comment as I stop, the lesson there really is that the history of looking at these materials and the historical trajectory seems to be that in the earliest encounters, people's interaction were based on stereotypical views that they had of each other from texts, from stories, <coughs> probably from tales told at home by parents. And as the interaction carried on more and more, and the human interaction took, you know, was more solidly grounded, then Christians and Muslims came more to see the humanity of each other. And therefore, you see that reflected in the writing that was taking place, where the writing became more positive, while there's still being plenty of polemical writing going on as well. And on that point, I think I'll end it there and uh, open it up for questions. So over to you, Martin.